One night, in the midst of an especially chaotic finals week during my sophomore year of college, I found myself in the library trying to cram as much physics knowledge into my head as I possibly could in the next eight hours. I texted a friend about it, venting my struggles, and he told me he had just the thing for me, saying that he'd recently faked an ADHD diagnosis to his doctor so he could get Adderall, and that he could lend me some so I could potentially really lock in over the course of the week. I was puzzled. I knew on one hand that I had the hard work and grit necessary to pull off the grade, but I also knew that the call of the unknown had me absolutely stumped. What if there's an extra edge that I'm missing out on, I thought to myself. What if everyone else but me is in on it, and what if I'm missing out on potential? I was incredibly close to caving in, and I stopped right before hitting send on the message telling him to go ahead and get me some. I ultimately decided that I'd rather not take the chance in the absolute crunch time of the semester. Now, to all the students out there watching this, perhaps this story sounds similar to one of your own, or maybe you're one of the up to 30% of students who have used Adderall outside of a prescription to study. In the hyper-competitive world of today, Adderall is now a normalized part of college life. However, it shouldn't be, because those that use the drug thinking it'll work as a quick fix for bad studying habits could not possibly be farther from the truth. But first, to understand where we're going with this, it's necessary to talk just a bit of relevant science. So dopamine is the feel-good neurotransmitter in the brain, responsible for the reward system and motivation for goal-oriented tasks. People with ADHD have a deficiency of dopamine, making it really difficult to do things like stay concentrated and motivated. Adderall helps by returning these levels back to normal. However, when individuals without ADHD take Adderall, the brain is absolutely flooded with dopamine and a high sense of self-confidence, alertness, and well-being wash over the brain. After a few precious hours of productivity, the inevitable crash ensues and dopamine levels tank lower than before, causing the exact opposite feeling. Natural dopamine levels are so low after Adderall misuse that a study in primates showed a decrease of about 30 to 50% from natural levels. This is how addiction starts, not to mention a plethora of mental health side effects, such as anxiety, depression, paranoia, and even suicidal ideations. And with Adderall, addiction is not out of the question. Adderall is classified as a Schedule II drug, putting it in the same category as cocaine and meth. But hey, if it makes you do better in school, get better grades, and get that perfect GPA, well, maybe it's all worth it. Maybe this is all just a small price you have to pay to become that optimal version of yourself. Well, and this is the reason why we're here today, what if I told you that nearly every single study ever done on this has completely disproven that exact idea? And what if I told you that this pervasive notion that somehow illicit amphetamine use will boost memory, focus, and learning has really always just been a giant myth? See, Sarah and I are part of a student research team at Binghamton University called Be Smart, also known as the Binghamton Student Managed Adderall Research Team. And we've actually found that across the board, in nearly every single study we've either conducted or reviewed, illicit Adderall use strongly correlates with lower GPAs. I'd like to repeat that. Illicit Adderall use strongly correlates with lower GPAs. Time and time again in our surveys, we see that the very same students who claim to use Adderall for the purposes of boosting cognition, improving memory, and achieving a better GPA, most often will get the exact opposite results. So taking a step back from all of this, it becomes evident that there's another factor at play here that causes people to have higher GPAs and get and be more productive overall. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what drug they're taking. In fact, we believe that what causes people to consider using Adderall to study in the first place is a much deeper condition known as learned helplessness. So this term describes a person who feels completely powerless in their day-to-day -day life, never giving themselves either the blame or the praise for anything that happens to them. And that's just it. Life is viewed as happening to people with learned helplessness. So let's do a little self-test. I want you all to think back to a time where you took a difficult exam. Picture yourself sweating, feeling anxious, or whatever you felt in that moment. Now, when you got your test back and you saw your score, how did you feel? Individuals with learned helplessness who did poorly likely blamed the teacher for making the test too hard. 
individuals with learned helplessness who did well in the exam likely credited their high mark to good luck. Conversely, for all of you who did poorly on this exam and thought that maybe this was a reflection of your lack of preparedness, this would be a representation of mastery orientation mindset. Mastery orientation mindset is quite literally the opposite of learned helplessness. This is a growth mindset where individuals attribute their successes to their hard work and believe that their abilities can be increased through effort. Humsa and I believe that those that use Adderall illicitly view the world through the lens of learned helplessness. Countless studies support the notion that those that misuse drugs have thought patterns associated with learned helplessness. In the case of illicit Adderall use, individuals use this drug because they don't have the confidence to perform well enough on their own. This thinking was the basis for a study conducted at the University of Pennsylvania. This study took 47 subjects and tested the working memory of them all. These individuals were either given a placebo pill or Adderall. Those that were given Adderall were more likely to report that the pill had enhanced their performance. This is interesting because there was absolutely no statistically significant difference in performance between the two groups. On top of this, both groups performed better than baseline measurements, leading the researchers to conclude that their success was a result of their confidence. This being said, there is absolutely nothing given to you by this pill that you don't have already. It really just makes you more confident in what you do have, working as little more than a glorified placebo effect. It gave you a taste of what you could potentially achieve if only you had the confidence. Now, if these subjects only needed a little bit of belief in their capabilities to make these improvements, then imagine on a broader scale all the achievements they have robbed themselves of over the course of their lifetimes. So taking a step back, let's take it as a lesson to stop experiencing the world passively, as if things are simply happening to you without any real input of your own. While life is guaranteed to throw you some nasty curveballs along the way, a learned helplessness mindset prevents you from rising to the occasion and becoming the best version of yourself in response to all of it. It'll strip you of your motivation, your ability to take action, and ultimately, your self-confidence. In insisting that you can never change your situation or improve on a specific ability, you fall into a brutal, self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, we understand that a lot of this might be pretty difficult to hear, but there's plenty of scientific research to back all of it up. A study at Vanderbilt, well, we mentioned dopamine earlier as the neurotransmitter associated with motivation and the reward system in the brain. Well, a study at Vanderbilt actually found that in the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain associated with higher order executive functioning, slackers have lower dopamine levels than go-getters, in a nutshell. Animal models on rats have found that learned helplessness correlates with lower densities of dopamine receptors in the brain. Essentially what this means is that the attitudes associated with high and low levels of motivation literally show up on the biochemical level. However, while some neurological conditions can absolutely, absolutely require medication to be fixed, it's also true that you can plant a seed in your mind to allow that same dopamine we talked about to be built over time. Barring any substantial neurological setbacks, it's absolutely true that a lot of the wiring of your brain is up to you and its chemistry is by no means set in stone. So the brain itself is plastic, meaning that it can adapt to the needs of its environment. Every time you think about a specific topic or perform a specific task, the neuronal connections in your brain that allow you to think about this topic or perform this task are strengthened. Conversely, for topics that you don't think about that, a lot, that often, the neuronal connections weaken the longer they go unused. These thought processes become less automatic and take more work to remember. Right now, you might have strong neuronal connections for a learned helplessness. You might automatically feel like you have absolutely no control over your successes or your losses. However, over time, if you try to reject these thoughts associated with learned helplessness and actively tell yourself that you are capable, you have control, and so forth, these thoughts will become automatic because their neuronal connections will have been strengthened. So this concept that our mindset has an immense control over every aspect of our lives can actually be seen in recent studies. One study was conducted by researcher Alia Crum and it revealed how much our mindset can manifest into, into the physiology of our body. So this study took housekeepers and split them into two groups. One group was shown a presentation about how their work was really good exercise while the other was not. 
A few weeks later, when the researchers came back, they found that the housekeepers that had been shown this presentation had a reduction in body fat, had a lower blood pressure, and had lost more weight than those that had not been shown this presentation. So what changed? These housekeepers didn't work any harder than they did before. Their mindset changed and their body physically responded to this change. This study is a great example of how responsive our minds are to changes in thought patterns. Using this, think about how much of a difference instilling a sense of capability will make. The truth is, in many, many areas of our lives, we are a lot like the housekeepers in this study. And the fact that a lot of us have fooled ourselves into thinking we need Adderall to study is but a small piece of evidence in the grand picture. When many of us were younger, it seemed as though our potential was limitless. At some point, though, as we got older and the world got more complicated, we lost that sense of possibility for ourselves. Take it from me, I was one of the former gifted children in early elementary school who never ever lived quite up to that in high school. But just because we forgot about that potential doesn't mean that it ever really went anywhere. And even if we never felt that potential to begin with, you know, maybe we didn't have the best childhood, that doesn't mean that we or those around us ever perceived our abilities accurately at all. Finding our lost potential and trying to feel capable is an ongoing battle. I too find myself falling down a hole of learned helplessness thinking at times. This happens most often when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed with my assignments. However, I've been able to overcome this by breaking down the seemingly impossible task into significantly smaller ones. I reward myself for any accomplishment I make on my way to achieving my larger goal. And by giving myself these little wins, I increase my, my sense of self-efficacy and it motivates me to keep going. It's definitely the furthest thing from a linear and smooth process, but it works. And you can never see it through if you abandon all hope at the first sign of struggle. In the less glorious moments, this can be very hard to remember, but sticking to it will, but staying faithful to it will pay off in the long run as long as you continue to work hard and you work smart, which is very important. But as you outdo yourself little by little, the progress should inspire you to keep going. So, bottom line is, the next time you come across a setback or a difficulty in learning something, don't see it as a sign that you should just give up or that it isn't for you or that you should pop a pill. Understand, though, that it's simply a very necessary rite of passage in getting to where you need to be. If you're struggling, you're doing something right. And there's no drug in the world that can change this fundamental fact of progress. To all the students watching this, you owe it to yourselves to bring to light that same potential that we keep going on about. Perhaps it's better this way without the existence of some miracle drug. In the process and the struggle of one-upping each and every one of your individual goals, no matter how big or how small, you continue to grow and impress yourself and realize just how competent you truly are. We wish you the very, very best of luck. That's it.